Yep, yeah, good afternoon everyone. So um, hopefully that's everyone in now and, and we'll welcome anyone else who comes in at a later stage. Um, so just want to kind of first introduce, so um, this afternoon we've got um, from his background. Um, what we're going to try and do over the next kind of course of the next couple of weeks is um, get some of our various different people to jump online, give us a bit of a background and experience into their situations uh, and kind of backgrounds in, in sport and how their kind of provisions work. So um, what I'll do is I'll chuck it over to um, to Adam to, to get things started. So if Jamie, if you want to, or Adam, if you want to kind of start sharing your screen and I'll fire it over to you then. So I'm just gonna stop sharing mine. Um, so you should be able to share yours. Now. Yeah, yeah, but I've got three kills. Oh, well, I suppose the reason he hadn't been offered internet <laughs> was because we've all done working from home. <laughs> but then I suppose if a, a little bit of law, obviously. That's what I'm, oh, oh well, he's doing what's right for him. All right. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping then before we start. Um, if if ev what I'm going to do is whilst uh, Adam's speaking, um, if everyone could just turn off their kind of audios, um, just so we can kind of just have the, the sound from the presenter. Um, and then we'll go through Adam's presentation and then there'll be various kind of moments where um, you can uh, go in the chat section and ask questions and there'll be a part at the end where it'll be a bit of a Q and A. Um, so if you want to get kick started, Adam, then it's over to you. Yeah, sure. Uh, I can take over. I said I don't mind about um, seeing video. I actually had a quick scroll and it's nice to see some some old faces and some new ones, some old names and some new ones too. So that's really good. So feel free to have the video on, but there may be the, the audio muted for now. Uh, first things first, just say welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie, for inviting me along. It's a great opportunity to talk about analysis and tennis, maybe something um, you don't hear about that often. So hopefully shed a light into kind of what we're doing here and how we're going about it. Uh, first things first, I guess it's a very strange time. So I hope everyone's staying safe and well back at home. I'm kind of keeping tabs on, on what's going on in the UK as well as what's going on in my own region here. Um, Firstly, tennis has been affected by this. We've got no play until July 13th, at the least. Um, you might have seen that Wimbledon is cancelled. They took a decision to cancel the tournament. Um, and other tournaments have tried to move around the calendar. So we're basically in a holding pattern. Players aren't really training unless they have their own facilities, their own kind of courts in their back gardens. But lots of people... Uh, staying fit and healthy, doing fitness challenges, working out from home, doing anything they can to kind of keep a racket in their hand. Um, better if Federer's body against the wall and stuff like that. So tennis players still trying to keep themselves ticking over and we're trying to help them with that as well in any way we can. Um, yeah, okay, so let's just start. So firstly, a little bit about me. I mean, I was really excited when this kind of came around. Um, being a University of Worcester graduate back in 2010 now, so feeling very old. Um, and kind of basically going to go through my journey through this and then also some of the stuff that's going on in tennis, which is maybe slightly different to um, football and rugby, even more akin to some of the, the individual sports that are out there. So my, my current role is... As a, in high performance analytics, which sounds, uh, sounds very nice, but it's performance analysis over here at the USTA in player development. Um, basically, in terms of my life, I grew up in southwest of England, in the Cotswolds in Gloucestershire. Um, played footy and tennis growing up my whole life. It was a little bit better at footy. Um, kind of went through an academy system and then kind of like hundreds of kids uh, dropped out and kind of thought, what do you do now? And then the idea was to work in sport in any way you can, like lots of people uh, kind of think and hope and kind of want to achieve. This picture here is a, from earlier on in the year. I really like this one. Um, this is from the Fed Cup, which was held over in 
just above Seattle, Washington, a place called Everett in a hockey center, which was amazing. Just put the court over the ice, which is fantastic. Um, we actually beat, it was, uh, sorry, we beat Latvia uh, 3-2, clinched it in the doubles. But that's uh, Sophia Kenning there, who basically arrived from Australia halfway through the week after winning her first Grand Slam. And she performed fantastically, fighting jet lag and, and the excitement and the nerves and everything going on. So uh, that's her after winning her first singles match to put us 1-0 one, one up in the tie. It's a really nice photo from earlier this year before all of this was going on. So yeah, so uh, me and Jamie were talking about what he would like to hear from, uh, kind of what topics might be of interest. Um, again, the first bit's kind of a personal journey and then secondly moves on to tennis and the landscape, um, how kind of how all the moving parts kind of work together, what we're doing here now in USTA player development, some of the technologies um, that we're using, which um, are similar to other ones, but then some are, some are slightly different. And then the last piece about delivery. So how we deliver to our coaches uh, and our players uh, at the USTA and just in tennis in general with all the challenges that it brings around. Hit back. So timeline. So as I said, years and years ago now, Craig Williams remember this as he's on the call. Um, 2007 started at Worcester, graduated 2010, and that's kind of my my first experience of analysis. Um, I did a sports coach in science and PE degree, and thankfully one of the modules in the second year we were getting exposed to performance analysis, and that kind of really sparked an interest in me. My idea going into the University of Worcester was to so, teach. Can I? Um... No, no, I'll talk to you. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so yeah, my, my, my plan going in was to teach, uh, teach secondary. And um, that was kind of still the plan afterwards. I talk about this little gap here between Worcester and Middlesex. I call it kind of the wilderness years of trying to, trying to think about actually what I want to do um, with my life. And I'm sure lots of people up there students or just graduated in this strange time as well is kind of going through that process and thinking what are the options and and what do i want to do but we, we were exposed to it we fantastically they set up a network with uh cl like football clubs in the local local area so i had some experiences with west brom my dissertation was actually in futsal so going up to sheffield and recording the british university uh, College of Sports finals and doing an analysis on that, um, which was great because it, it gave me the whole kind of going up there, filming it all myself, having to tag it through. It was novel. No one was really doing too much in futsal at that time. So a really, really good experience. And Worcester had a, had a great analysis and the setup there for us, which is now 10 times better. So uh, a really, really good place, really fond memories and very thankful for their exposure to me to, to performance analysis. Um, so in this kind of wilderness, this little bit here, um, like lots of people, it, it, it included traveling a little bit and uh, teaching, so working in schools, uh, but not quite doing my PGCE yet, and then kind of figuring out what I wanted to do. And in this time, I was going for studentships and also PGCE interviews. Um, I was kind of just missing out on the analysis studentships. Um, and seeing more and more studentships come about, which is fantastic. So I, I was really determined at that time to try and try and learn on the job uh, and be doing it as well as getting paid and kind of moving that way through the career. Uh, so it's great that more and more of those are kind of happening. So yeah, so but I was missing out. So okay, what do I do? I do my I, I do my masters for a year while still trying to fund it and work at the same time. Uh, and Middlesex is one of a few at that time who were. Uh, we were offering the course and it was achievable for me to get, excuse me, to get to. Uh, and a fantastic course, um, great lecturers. Um, you'll know the people there, Nick James, Mike Hughes. Um, great support and just a really fantastic program as well. A really heavy um, emphasis on, on placements. So I was able to do some stuff at Bristol City. I was able to work in Javelin. And crucially for me, I was able to 
do my dartfish certification in that time as well uh which really really helped me going into into future roles which brings me into the end of that year um the summer of that year so british tennis um had a small team of analysts and they were looking to add to this uh luckily uh came across an, an internship applied got the role and kind of got my foot in the door at the national tennis center in roehampton uh, spent six six very very happy years uh in london and and, and working there uh firstly I, i go on to say that the different projects we were doing um in a bit but firstly as part of the wheelchair program as you're ramping up towards rio so off the back of london uh and then moving through picking up different projects and players and um and activities going through up until 2019 and uh, so last last august the middle of last august coming out here to the states right before us open qualies literally the day before landed in uh a baptism of fire and uh, a really intense tournament but fantastic so that's about seven months here now at, at the usta uh player development so british tennis as i said you see the bottom right hand corner here the, the wheelchair program so uh a fantastic opportunity to me to come in there was a few things set up but nothing systematic um we wanted to learn more about the sport we wanted to know uh the norms the profiles we wanted to support our players uh in analysis uh they had everything else so something we wanted to add in and we wanted to get a leading edge kind of over the other nations and the sport was really growing in terms of its exposure its integration into the grand slams the prize money and everything really and it, it still continues to be a sport which is thriving and going places so uh a really really great experience and then in into that you see left here so the, national talent id programs at the time as well so helping out coaches with the filming collecting data on those hundreds of kids going through that program um and then also with the grass court seasons at wimbledon which i'm sure you can imagine a very very hectic uh and a real emphasis on trying to do everything we could to help british tennis players succeed during that time when the the kind of the eyes of the nation are on on the lta in that time and the british players to to deliver So moving on a few more year, years later I see a very successful Rio and started moving across to working with some of the uh ATP and WTA pros on the tour um helping their coaches with analysis and feed excuse me feedback scouting project work everything really um and also the culmination one of my kind of happiest happiest times being part of the Davis Cup team there you see that stuff in Glasgow and I'm sure lots of people identify with this just having a great bunch of people to to work with as well there's there's other members of the team of course but um like lifelong friends and analysts and colleagues there brings me nicely on to player development in USTA so when I when I first week so Martin Blackman is a general manager here um the USTA and US Open it's a, well, what's it like what's what's going on is it different is it what, what is it doing the same we're doing similar stuff and the question is and you'll find people will notice if they've gone from one footy club to another football club maybe or a different rugby club it's it's same same but different it's the sport is the same the, the players in the most part are the same the coaches uh, obviously everyone's slightly different in the in the way they work and the way they approach things but uh we're still analyzing tennis Uh so I kind of turn around and say it, it's same same but different it just might be a different focus on certain things but we're using similar technologies and we're all trying to help improve our players and ultimately try and win tennis matches so this uh just going around just a brief seven months so um we'll come on to it in a bit but these are some some kind of colleagues or not in analysis but people who who chip in during uh during the US Open to help us achieve our goals um left you'll see like still the, this many years on is there's, there's no there's nothing wrong with collecting this is a qualies match which uh was going to go on in a couple of hours you'll see the camera in the bottom left hand corner so there's there's still the need sometimes to to film my matches to get it in tag it and turn it around um so we haven't got everything in terms of infrastructure even at somewhere 
like the biggest tournaments. This here is um, bottom right is kind of uh, college. The college obviously a, a different one here because it's such a huge pathway for players. Uh, it can be seen as a really crucial one, which maybe is not so much seen at, at home with the university system, but increasingly is. Um, and British players will obviously come over, international players will come over to play just because of the crowds, as you can see there, and the, the ability to uh, get an education as well as, as train at the same time. And with the average age of the, the ATP and WTA, kind of, or the ATP especially going up, the ability to come out of college and be that little bit older kind of works for some people in terms of their, their development and their maturation and, and just basically them, them as a person, their personality. And top right, which is one of the, the happiest additions to kind of my role as being part of um, the coaching education we do here. So this is a high performance coaching program we run in January at the national campus here in Orlando. Uh, a group of 18 coaches who come in for three days um, and then go off, have work to do, and we, we come back and we do catch-ups and evaluations and everything. So just a really great program to be a part of. Uh, and something I, I kind of really, really enjoy. Bottom left here, I mean, lots of people can kind of identify with that. That's leaving the US Open. That's my life in those two bags and then all of the analysis kit in the other three. So leaving, being the last to leave a tournament and having to carry everyone else's stuff back to, back to base. So basically this, this is where we are. I mean, this is uh, the USTA National Campus in Lake Nona, Orlando, which is South, South Orlando. Um, we're very, very lucky to have the facilities we have. So this was opened in early 2017. Uh, 100 tennis courts, um, plenty with, with smart courts, so with, excuse me, with play site on, so immediate streaming and data uh, that we can access. And it's a, it's a pro facility as well uh, for us, obviously, but it's also a recreational facility. So lots and lots of activity. Um, lots of college matches, lots of tournaments, so national tournaments, all kind of age groups, uh, high schools, everything going on. So a real kind of hub of activity for tennis in, in the United States. Just a, a really good atmosphere and place to work with plenty of ideas. We're very lucky to have a performance lab. Um, you see right, this is my, it's my boss, Dave, Dave Ramos, who has kind of been a pioneer for this in the, in the tennis world. Uh, in the US uh, and it's kind of built up in the last last 10 years or so moving through kind of technique analysis into tagging to building a department um, so kudos to him and what, what he's kind of done here and continues to do to do here so we're a small team it's just two of us but we draw on other people within the organization to help out um, it's Jeff and Kathy who support their players with this as well who who kind of come in and grind and, and work and help us as well. Um, as you see there, then that's on the campus. So you be careful of the alligators as, as you're walking around as well. So in terms of performance team approach, I mean, I, I'm lucky that when I came into to tennis, um, the program I was working in, the wheelchair program initially, was a, a UK sport funded program on the most part. So I had a lot of this in place of kind of how they wanted to work. Uh, especially with the influence from the EIS, the partnerships we had from them. Um, and this, this is kind of carried on through most of the players, pretty much all, excuse me, all the players I've worked with and what we kind of continue to do here at the USTA. Um, how this is different with a lot of people on the call are working in team sports is uh, the, the, there is a kind of a dynamic there, which is, uh, more akin to maybe golf where the, the player is really the center and the, the player is really driving a lot of their own uh, their own decisions they employ a coach which makes them at the behest of the coach in terms of ideas but they're also on the most part their their employer have control over uh, who they hire so kind of a, a dynamic there which is which is pretty unique uh, and these are just my experiences of, of some of the really important people who surround the tennis player and how we try and work together around that. So analytics, s &C, doctor, physio, some kind of uh, massage therapy, rehab, prehab, uh, call it mental coach, but whether that's well-being or whether that's psychology, uh, just that bucket. Uh, 
and how we really kind of all work together to to try and improve the player in any way we can. And then just some of the really important people around that player to support them uh, emotionally, uh, as well as with the, the technical and tactical aspects of everything. And we, we really try to instill that here uh, at the USTA with, with regular check-ins, um, performance team, performance team meetings and um, yeah, everyone bringing it to the table to see how we can help improve the player. Okay, so as I said, just to, some people might not be familiar with tennis um, in terms of they might see it when it comes on in the, in the summer or wherever you are in the world, you'll see it ramp up in your, your area that time of year, but it really is a, a kind of all year round global event. Um, so this is some numbers here. So you've got 63 ATP tournaments over the year, and that's just the, the top level ATP. So not even including challenges, so the lower levels where people are really going to far flung places to grind and try and get points and work their way up the, the ranking system. You'll see studies on, on at what point a tennis player needs to be ranking wise to break even. Uh, and it changes from, from men to women. Um, but you look in the, the top couple of hundred or so um, without kind of federation support or a sponsor of this and that, really it's an expensive sport to play and the, and the prize money uh, against that means, means it can be a real struggle to make, make your way in this. Uh, so 63 tournaments on the ATP side, 55, I think I got that on WTA. And obviously the four Grand Slams you see. Obviously, this was supposed to be an Olympic year, uh, so that moved to next year. Uh, and a part of that as well is the Davis and Fed Cup, which is basically the, the World Cup uh, of tennis, which is slightly evolving and changing, changing every year. That's the one thing I say. I mean, tennis was kind of late to the table in terms of analysis and uh, its adoption. But really, in my experience, in the last six years, seven years, it's really ramping up in terms of innovation and, and, and what it's doing. So whether that's changing the format of tournaments to try and uh, move towards shorter formats or whether it's, so Davis Cup's moved to a one week, the finals, same with the Fed Cup, it's moved to the finals to a one week event. Uh, bringing in things like Labor Cup and ATP Cup, um, and especially all of those are starting to bring analysis to the, to the forefront of um, the coach's experience. So rather than before, traditionally when I came in, it was pretty much 100% pre-match analysis. You go and play, and then there's an element of post-match analysis, and you either go to the next tournament or you're playing again. Uh, with Davis Cup, Fed Cup, ATP Cup, you'll see more and more, um, uh, and also on the WTA Tour, to be fair, with the, with the tablet the coaches get, more and more trying to put data uh, excuse me, into the hands of the coaches to be able to use um, either during the matches or immediately or during the tournament. So a real kind of change and shift there. So it's really, really kind of keeping up with other sports, I think now. Uh, and whether that's driven by, by TV or fan engagement or whatever it is, it's, it's happening in tennis and it's only going to increase more with more kind of on-court coaching and more opportunities to have interventions with players. Uh, you see it's a global event, lots of tournaments going on. Uh, in terms of governing bodies as well, you've got the ITF, which is the governing body uh, of the sport, but then you have the ATP, which is the men's side, the men's pro, uh, WTA, which is women's, the Women's Tennis Association. And obviously you have the four Grand Slam nations, uh, so Tennis Australia, uh, Wimbledon, but within that the LTA, the governing body of, uh, tennis in, in Britain, the French Federation, and then obviously us here at the, the USTA who have who tasked with running the US Open as well. And it's such a huge, fantastic event that is. The player schedules, um, again, a kind of a real tricky one. I mean, I'm, I'm very jealous of anyone out there who's working in team sports who, who has to worry about one fixed location, one, one training ground or one stadium where they can set their cameras and then come back on the next Saturday and everything's okay, the infrastructure's in place. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a real kind of, there's lots of moving parts in terms of player schedules and tournaments and people running different tournaments. Some are 
run by the governing body, some are run by uh, private private companies. So a kind of a lot going on. So a real kind of challenge, but a great opportunity to develop relationships around the world and uh, and try and develop partnerships so everyone can kind of achieve what they need to achieve and ultimately tennis gets better, players get better and the, the kind of sport uh, in terms of a, a fan spectacle hopefully is improving. The player schedule is an interesting one because depending what level you're at and we, we support players right up and down um, right up and down the pathway from, from top pros to then those who are lower in the rankings those maybe who are moving up through the rankings through their age and then also juniors as well um, so real kind of challenge to get video and, and data all together uh, but, a, but a really good challenge and player schedules as well can can really change throughout the year uh, say you have a good good few weeks down in australia that suddenly sets your year up and maybe you don't have to play you, the next two tournaments because your ranking is such a place where you get automatic entry into a larger tournament. So definitely with player schedules, it's kind of, this is plan A, this is plan B, depending on how we do here. And this is maybe plan C, depending on, on how you do as well. So a lot of moving parts, unless you're at the very top of the game and you've got automatic entry into grand slams, you're able to, if you're at that point, you're able to schedule a little bit better. Uh, which obviously is a, is a huge win and a huge bonus because it really, really helps with your period, periodization, uh, moving through the year and really planning to peak at certain events, uh, as well as keeping your body healthy, fit uh, throughout the year and not having to all of a sudden go play another week because you're chasing points. And uh, so, yeah, really brutal sport. And um, uh, yeah, the players, are, the players are flying around everywhere and, and competing for points. and uh, yeah, really, a really kind of um, individual and solo existence for the for these players. But I uh, see the real highs you see uh, on TV as well. I guess make it all worth it. So we just move on. So that leads me on to kind of data in tennis, and um, these are kind of a few quotes and and. I don't think these people can really lay claim to these quotes. Maybe they, they've recycled it like we all do. We, we steal and regurgitate. But I know Dave definitely stole this from MIT Sloan when we were in Boston uh, about over a month ago. But I uh, had the opportunity to work with Chris, who was uh, EIS uh, boss for a long time. He came over to the LTA and kind of hit the nail on the head of what is going on in tennis. As you can imagine, it's a, a fractured landscape. So it means only makes sense that the, the data uh, and where it sits and who it sits with and who owns it is, is a fractured landscape as well. Um, so tennis is data rich, but, but data disparate. And we'll go on to a bit more of that as well. Uh, Ramos, uh, this really stuck with him and I, I can't remember who said it at the conference, so I'll have to, uh, uh, have to attribute, attribute them to another time. But and it does feel like this sometimes we're, we're kind of drowning in data in tennis data, but we're kind of starved at the insights unless you can really wrangle the different sources and bring them all together. Um, a real example, how you use the kind of the DK, DKIW kind of pyramid from turning data to knowledge, to information, to hopefully up to wisdom. And that's, that's kind of our goal and kind of give us some time back uh, by improving our systems. It is, this is, true of anywhere I've been to try and front load so much of our work so that we can just plug it in and spend more time uh, delivering insights and working with coaches and players rather than, uh, rather than grinding. And then this is, I attribute this to various coaches. I was going to put a name here because someone said it recently, but I uh, kind of heard this throughout and I'm sure lots of people do, but just kind of just tell me, sounds a little bit aggressive, but tell me what, what this means for me and my player. Like, that's great, but what what does it mean for me? I'm 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 going out on court this week. We got a training week. Uh, what is it? What does it mean for me? Which is which is really a, an important one and a skill to to turn that turn that data turn it into something and condense it into a sentence. Even though there's all this work kind of that's, that's gone on behind it. So moves on to our, our kind of our key technologies that, that we're using. 
Um, I alluded to dartfish earlier. Um, seems to be the, the kind of standard uh, in tennis. There are, there are some uh, tennis organizations I know using some other things. But it really does tick all the boxes excuse me, for us in terms of um, its ability to do technical, which is obviously a huge part of tennis, um, especially as we're going up through the, the ages and stages to make technical changes, which hopefully um, give the player good fundamentals um, going into kind of the rest of their, their career and their, their, their game style. Um, and obviously the tactical the tactical stuff as well. So just the match analysis um, and the tagging element of that, which is a huge part. So Dartfish is a huge one for us. And obviously the online solution of Dartfish TV and um, pushing up up to the cloud um, is, is brilliant for us because of the remote nature of a lot of our delivery. Um, players are playing all over the world, uh, different time zones. So our ability to have an online platform for them, which is um just mirroring what, whatever we're doing within the software uh is really really important and then hawkeye i mean you'll see hawkeye as a the line calling there's lots of uh, obviously calls excitement and where, where the kind of video uh replay has worked really really well really huge success story in, in, in tennis uh, so hawkeye is a vision processing technology if you haven't kind of come across it yet but a multi-camera setup, about eight to 10 tracking cameras around the court. The guys are in before tournaments, uh, a week or so before setting it all up. More and more courts are getting Hawkeye, uh, which is great because it means we can support more and more of our players with the Hawkeye data. And the fans are getting a better deal as well because of the video replay, the excitement. So they're seeing it on most of the courts. Um, and it, the idea with Hawkeye is that it's, there's eight to 10 cameras and it's tracking, but at any one time, several of those cameras are triangulating. So if it's down one end, it might not be picking up, but several of them are, are picking up and triangulating and, and processing both the player uh, and, and the ball. So it, it opens up a whole world of um, kind of feedback for us in terms of we'll come on to in a bit, but bounce locations, speed, spin, player tracking, so heat maps, all the stuff you see in other team sports with, I guess, um, Opta and stuff like that. Um, be our real kind of these, these I say were our, our kind of key technologies, as well as um, were moving into the area of wearables. So, so far in tennis, you can't be wearing a wearable while you're playing, but some, especially the next gen, have started to bring that in. So there's one tournament a year with the ju with not, not juniors, but the, the young, the young guys on the tour, um, where they're starting to innovate and, and wear wearables and the catapult. Um, and that's moved really into the training uh, arena as well. So technologies like Connect Something Catapult and all these kind of things, which is kind of where we're moving to as well. But in terms of our analysis, Dartfish and Hawkeye are kind of our fundamentals in terms of feeding back to players and coaches. So yeah, I said, Darfish is a, a great one for us to be able to support our coaches and players up and down the pathway, every age and stage. The fundamentals are kind of, kind of the same. So from match tagging at the top to simple tagging during uh, national camps, and this is the same in any kind of tennis role I've used, um, and replace those buttons with kind of... Uh, say they're working on a certain thing, maybe they're working on their, their second serve return. So just the ability to coaches to uh, one, one click of a button to marry the information on the, on the court with, uh, in, a, in a practice environment with the feedback they want to give uh, in a video setting. So that, that's a huge one for us. So that's Dartfish Easy Tag. And then moving here, so our ability to do, obviously a very technical sport, ability to give technical feedback, um, key positions, uh, and tactical feedback as well. So not only the video, but start to, I guess you see a lot of this in football and rugby with the, um, with the graphics and, and being really trying, trying to be innovative in terms of how we're feeding back to players. 
and as I said, Hawkeye as well. What's been great about Hawkeye is it's the more and more coaches uh, and players see it, the more comfortable they are with it, the more they understand what's going on. Uh, so it's used heavily on a broadcast, uh, but there's also options out there to uh, visualize the data yourself and bring in your own data of your own players and start to do feedback and comparisons uh, of development areas they're working on. Just t take this bottom left-hand corner. This is a, uh, a real example of how potentially if you're looking at uh, depth uh, with your ground strokes, uh, a way of taking the ball bounce locations uh, and feeding back on, on whether they need to get more depth uh, with their ground strokes, with the forehand, the backhand, um, and just being really flexible with, with that and create, creating kind of really good visuals that players and coaches are, are used to seeing, as well as providing feedback on what's going on in their, in their game. So points won, points lost. This is different serve locations, which is obviously a huge one for tennis. Uh, one where players have complete control over, over where they're going to serve. And then here on the right-hand side, this is, this is from Hawkeye, around some of the kind of the variables which are, which are collected uh, when they're tracking the ball. So the speed into the bow, the speed out of the bounce, the net clearance. So I hope you can see something like net clearance straight away. We can start be feeding back using this data if someone's making a technical change to their serve, they're looking to get, get up to the serve more. They're looking, maybe they're hitting, serving into the net a lot to so try and we can really track that things like that net clearance, uh, their spin on the ball. Uh, maybe they're working on their kick serve so we can, we can look at RPM and um, serve deviation where it's crossing, where it's cro crossing the, uh, the tram lines here. So are they getting their player uh, off of the court with their, with their first serve? So endless kind of ability with this player tracking software to, to feed back to our players and really dive into some of the, the ball characteristics, which we just can't get from video. Um, which brings me on to kind of whatever, whatever sources are out there. Obviously, we're, we're very fortunate to be um, in a position with, with our players and how we're supporting them to have access to to that stuff, but there is a whole host of kind of data in tennis in little pockets, which um, we've definitely used in the past, I've used and is available for people out there to, to go in and have a look at and build an up idea, maybe pull out their own stuff and maybe do pieces of work as well. Um, so the ATP on their website have a serve and return tracker, which is uh, built by Infosys and uh, using the Hawkeye data. There's all kinds of stuff on there, like leaderboards from the year. You can kind of uh, have a look at individual match stats. Uh, so going in and looking, well, why, why did this player win this match? Uh, what was their first serve points one percentage? What happened on the second serve points one, which is, which is normally a big one. Um, and same with the WTA as well, the, the kind of head-to-heads as well and the, the stats and the leaderboards. The Grand Slams really kind of ramp it up and all doing their own kind of different things and trying to innovate. You have more detailed match stats, maybe incorporating some Hawkeye data. Um, you have the event statistics, so uh, how many aces a certain player hit over, over the tournament or the longest rally and, and stuff like that. And also the player profiles and the stats, so going into the tournament, how uh, are they coming in, in in good form? How many tournaments have they won this year? What's their win-loss for the year? Uh, their ranking. And as well, with, with all of these, uh, you can go in and have a look at players' rankings. You start to do things with player trajectories as well. And just on the on the end, if, if people are curious and um, are into tennis and into their stats, and these are just some of the ones um, I kind of have going on my life, there's, there's plenty more. This, this isn't uh, an exhaustive list, but um, these are just some good ones that I try and kind of put in my ears when I'm, when I'm walking around here. Um, so Tennis Abstract, Jeff Sackman does some fantastic stuff with his match charting project. Uh, and you can be a part of that too. It's, it's open source. You can, you can uh, analyze matches for him in his way uh, and be a part of building up a, a really, really, really big and robust tennis database 
which then he does blogs and podcasts about and lots of people use to do to do some tennis analysis and some findings so that's a really good one so that's tennis abstract uh core tennis um provides loads of stats as you move away from the atp and wta tour so you can kind of find a lot of the the lower level stats on there of players um stats on the t is uh stephanie kobolchik so she has a uh, a blog um, where she puts stuff out, current themes, using data, uh, really user-friendly, reader-friendly, so a really good blog to check out. Uh, 538, which a lot of people would have heard of, uh, with Carl Bialik, and then Amy Lundy comes on and does some bits as well. Uh, again, a really good one for kind of using numbers, but then also talking around it. So a blend of journalism and numbers, which is, which is great. And it would be remiss of me not to... Um, not to talk about compete like a champion which is our usta player development uh podcast uh which dave ramos my, my boss was on a few weeks ago but they have some really good podcasts with players and coaches and people in the field um so dr larry lara and johnny parks are on that one which kind of brings me to to my last slide it's just one slide but i think there'll be um a bit more to talk about so the, the, this is kind of i mean I, I i far from know it all there's i mean i i know uh i know very very little but what i what i have kind of built up and in kind of sharing my experiences of the last seven years working in this unique sport and just analysis in general these seem to be in terms of delivery the the kind of the big ones for me so is is the delivery remote or is it in person? I think one of the, just a, a segue, one of the best things about, um, one of the best things about this current climate is that the people have really kind of accelerated their use of video uh, conferencing platforms and, uh, and just a bit more kind of, um, a bit more used to jumping on a call, jumping on a Google Hangout, uh, sharing a screen and, and, and this and that. So I, I hope that that's kind of a, that will, as a silver lining, kind of improve the remote aspect of lots of people's uh, feedback in the future. But we, 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 are, we are feeding back remote. We, we're supporting remote a lot of the time. We're, we're in Lake Nona, Orlando, and, and people are playing over in Beijing. They're playing in Australia. They're down under. Um, they're playing in Europe uh, for, a lot of the, for a lot of the summer. So really kind of, honing our skills in terms of well, how do we get this information to people um do we use email email has a low kind of um kind of success rate and a hit rate um do we uh don't move too much into to people's kind of personal spaces with their with their text or whatever but it, it's very very comfortable and you have good relationships and that's a, a great way to be especially sending links which can send them direct to the information um, that's all kind of then contained uh, by us and safe. But uh, a real challenge of how you communicate remotely. I mean, I work with coaches who just want to text. I work with coaches who leave WhatsApp voice messages, uh, which isn't natural for me, but then you kind of write, okay, well then our WhatsApp voice message back. Um, taking screenshots and, and sending over, so just any kind of way to try and, uh, innovate to uh, support players remotely, uh, support coaches wherever they are. And then in person, I think this is so, so crucial. And you, you speak to anyone who's, especially in tennis um, and just the all around sporting landscape, the, the ability to, I guess for us, we, we kind of look at it as several checkpoints in the year where we can be there and be in person, budget and, and time. Um, dependent to kind of either continue to build on previous relationships and show new kind of uh, features and different things we're doing, find out how we can support them better uh, or, or build new relationships with people because um, as, as you kind of see in tennis, you, coaches have a kind of a shorter kind of lifespan. Um, so you could be doing having a fantastic rapport with a coach. I mean, I had it with a player I was working with over two years, 
um, three different coaches, um, which isn't that uh, which isn't that abnormal. Um, so the first one, very kind of used to analysis, had a pre-existing relationship with um, a company uh, on the WTA or tour, providing this stuff. So very kind of used to it. So straight away, great. Like, like how can I help you? Very comfortable with data. This is what you want. This is what I can provide. Perfect. Um, that ended. Then you move into the next one. Okay, less kind of um, savvy with with information and data, but from here, from the way, from when he played, um, his dad used to uh, record matches off of the the TV, uh, and then text him. Uh, no, text him. It was even before that. Ring him wherever he was in the world and and give a breakdown of a player in terms of where they served on break point and stuff like that. So real kind of innovator. I was blown away but when I heard that. So for him, a huge one for him was, okay, just uh, give me some some snippets of kind of break points. Where do they serve? Where do they tend to go? What are their tendencies? And then a huge one for video, like wanting to see as much as that player as possible against players of a certain game style, uh, obviously on a certain uh, surface that they would be playing on and then the third one uh, through that period a real kind of attention to detail uh, kind of a real kind of one who was really in love with the the art of the the art of the game uh, and I didn't really initially see how we could bring this into his space which is which is totally fine it's, it's not for everyone it's a tool there to be to be used to assist the coaching process and if it's it's not for you then actually far be it from me to try and impose this, this service on you. Um, but I, I do think on the most part, with the, there's always something in the toolkit that, that everyone can use. And for him, after building relationship, it, was, it turned into a real kind of, well, we can help you, support you technically with, with, with this player in the off season. And really going into the fine detail frame by frame of, that player's technique, which is to see him work and to see him kind of what he was looking at uh, was kind of, was fascinating. So three different coaches there, three totally different people, three totally different personalities working with the same player uh, with a different uh, analysis influence uh, with each one. Um, who is, refers to like who, who's giving the feedback, who is delivering, which is, which is a huge one for me. Like, um, I, I didn't play to to a great level. Um, I'm coming into this world not having uh, not having played uh, on the tour or anything like that. Like a lot of the coaches, are, see their, their kind of CVs are incredible of, of the tournaments they've played in, their rankings, who they've coached, and everything. So um, for me, delivery on the most part is, especially when as a player, is is best delivered by the coach. Um, and I've always kind of seen my role in, in everything is a, as a facilitator of that, of that feedback. Um, and I'm very, very comfortable and I'm very happy, happy doing that. Um, I guess for me, it's, it, it kind of boils down to as well, like what's your, what's your identity as a, as an analyst. I and mean, when we talk a lot in tennis about what's your identity as a player, like, like, who are you? What do you do? What are your, what are your strengths? Like what, what are you bring into the court? Uh, and for me, I think as if I've gone on and I look back at people I've worked with and I'm like, oh, they're so good at doing that. That's their identity as an analyst. This person um, is such a good communicator and relationship builder, whereas this one is so technical. Uh, and that I kind of think about that as well. Like, well, what is my identity as an analyst? And what, what would I say my strengths and indeed my, my weaknesses are? Um, so that's a real one to think about. And I think especially as you're going for roles, thinking about, well, what, what do I bring to the table? What can I bring to this role that maybe they don't have? And what is my super strength? Be it technical, be it a software, uh, or be it your kind of your soft skills, which, um, which I thank the IS with the sports, uh, for performance course they, they ran, which I attended, which is a huge thing on soft skills and, and how you how you approach delivering your information. I mean, just personally, I can talk about when I first kind of started and doing projects um, and putting it in front of for coaches who I wanted to to influence or help. And I was so eager to help. 
and it wasn't hitting the mark and I thought it was like I thought it was good work and I was like well why isn't this hitting the mark and my immediate instinct was to go away and make it even more even better even more bells and whistles and oh no they can't they can't not like look at this now whereas really it wasn't even about that it was about kind of listening and and spending more time with them and kind of thinking about trying to work out what they actually wanted rather than kind of what I got excited about and thought is what they wanted. Uh, the last one is time frame, which is a, a huge one for us in terms of delivery. Players are playing, uh, they're done as said, they're onto the, they're onto the next tournament. So if, if you, if you miss that pocket of time, uh, they, they could be playing in the next tournament and say second serve return wasn't, wasn't great this week. Um, or the second serve was going away a little bit and you've kind of noticed that or you're feeding back and maybe you do a little something a little project on it with a technical or tactical or whatever and then they play a couple of games and as uh, say a couple of matches in the next week and their second serve is is so good um and you still feed that back but like you you've missed you've missed the the, the time frame of when that really would have been effective to help support the coach in that situation um so that's a huge one for us. It's so fast paced moving and it doesn't have a set structure. Uh, as I said, tournaments can change. You say you, you go out early one week, you weren't, you weren't meant to play Acapulco the next week, but you, you stick it in because um, you're feeling fresh and it, you, you want to maybe go get the points. Or, um, so yeah, so a huge one for us time frame, And a part of that is time zones as well. Um, so I mean, uh, lots of analysts I've worked with talk about being up at some time in the morning to try and support down under and especially I'm working here I have no idea I haven't yet worked out what the time zone is anywhere uh, only just back home and then I can't do the math to work out what it is down, down in Australia or Beijing or uh, so it's a real kind of uh, <laughs> a real kind of headache so getting information to people in a time frame which is useful is a huge one, be that pre-match or post-match. If you haven't got it to them in time and they can't access it, players are, uh, and coaches are creatures of habit in terms of rituals and routines. Maybe they like to go over the game plan for the match the next day, the night before. Uh, and if you're sending it on the morning, th th there's no point. It's not, gonna, it's not gonna impact the game plan. It's not gonna help in any way whatsoever. Um, so that's 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 a huge one. Being wary of of time frames and just trying to be as possible, trying to be um, trying to be as prepared as possible for a sport which can change on you in any moment. So say you're supposed to play, uh, you're supposed to play Zverev, and then uh, he has to pull out for injury. Lucky loser gets his spot. So last minute on a Monday morning, you find out your player is playing somewhere else. So then it's scramble mode to try and pull something together. Uh, which, which is pretty common. Um, so this huge one is time frame and just being adaptable and flexible and, um, and just trying to have it all set up so that you're prepared as possible so you're not caught out. As part of that is Davis Cup as well and Fed Cup and you can change the player you're playing within uh, an hour or two before the match. So uh, having everything and that has happened in, in time as well. So just being totally prepared, having every, cape, every kind of uh, base covered as much as possible um, yeah, it's a, it's a challenging, challenging sport. And the last one is trust, which I, I alluded to earlier. I remember with that last coach, uh, who I said was very technical, attention to detail. Um, kind of, I think, I think it was about two days until we actually spoke about um, the player and how we could help and this and that. I think we spoke the last first couple of times talking about where he grew up and then what languages he spoke and then what languages I wanted to learn and kind of uh, he was really interested in languages and semantics and everything and we would, we would talk about that and then I think that really really did help in terms of being comfortable a couple of days later to come into the lab and um, and be like oh let's let's pull up the server let's have a little look at that uh, so just developing that relationship and trust and on a human level as well and getting I think I kind of, in the early days, and I think I still kind of do, is, is how much do I show of myself and is that unprofessional and where, where, is, where is the line in terms of 
personality and professionalism and my work life and my personal life. And that I think is just a, a constant battle, uh, but a, a good one. I mean, you want people to know you and trust you uh, and ultimately everyone wants to be, wants to be liked, but just kind of knowing where you sit within, within that, I think is, is, is really kind of important, important to me, especially because I spend so much time with these people. Some of my, uh, best, best friends have been colleagues in, in the past and here just a, a huge, uh, friend network with colleagues as well. So I'm really thankful for, for those, for that, especially moving to a new country. Um, I think, I think that's pretty much the end of the webinar. I mean, I, I waffled on for a, enough time, which I can tend to do. Um, this doesn't come naturally for me to presenting. So this is very much out of my, my comfort zone. So it's, um, something I, I kind of push myself to do, to put it, put myself out there. Um, and kind of, hopefully if anyone picks up one little thing here and there from this to help them wherever they are, especially if they're students and coming out of this very strange time into a, a kind of a world which is kind of a little bit uncertain right now, especially in sport. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's great. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, Jamie and John, and thank you everyone for kind of jumping on the call. And um, really, if there's anything, just reach out on, on, on LinkedIn. I'm keen to hear from other people in other sports and, and what they're doing and, and just continue to develop and, and build relationships in this because it's such a fascinating area of sport and it's only going to grow. And just, it's just a fascinating thing to be involved in, both in, in sport and in tennis. So I'll throw it back to you, Jamie. If there's any questions, uh, I'm happy to field them. Uh, thanks, Adam. Um, I think uh, that was a really kind of uh, fascinating insight and um, really appreciate you kind of giving up your time uh, to jump on the call. Obviously, appreciate the, the different time zones. Obviously, we've been trying to, to find the best time for everyone as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, we've got a, a few questions kind of coming through. So um, if it's okay, then a, a few kind of been private message. So I'll um, kind of kick start with the first one and then maybe if anyone else has any uh, kind of questions, if they want to go on the microphone or uh, then please feel free. Uh, but the first one I've got is um, in terms of KPIs, um, in terms of your tagging aspect, is it some specific KPIs that you would tend to, to use on your panels or does this tend to, to kind of come, you know, but dependent on the player or is it kind of very specific? Yeah, yeah, really good question. Um, so in terms, of, in terms of our match tagging, um, kind of judicially been, tennis has been on a, on a, a point by point basis. This is the point, this is what happened. Lots of focus around serve and return uh, and the, the, early, the early shots in a point because, uh, and it, I mean, around 2000, you'll see Craig O'Shaughnessy, who's been a real kind of advocate for analysis and work with Novak. And, uh, and we kind of seen this as well. Just so much, of the, so much of the game is within that one to four, one to four shots. So I'd say around two thirds. So that drives a lot of like kind of what you're looking at. Uh, as well as the point ending, so um, what happened at the end of the point? How, how did it finish? And, and within that as well, like well, what's going on in the point? At the USTA, we try and uh, our philosophy is around developing complete players. So that's that's around uh, different aspects of their game as well, like slice and coming into the net, which kind of all players want to have the ability based on their game style uh, to do. Um, but yeah, so a lot around the start of the point. Uh, KPIs in tennis. I mean, first serve points one. If you if you read the literature, there I mean, there's, there's a lot out there. Uh, first serve points one is always a huge one because I guess you have so many first serves. Um, what percentage are you getting in? How many of them are you able to win? Um, that, that's a big one, and a huge one is one to four. As I said, so much of the game is there. Can you win that? Uh, can you be on the better side of that? Of that battle so in terms of serve return first ball off of the serve uh are you able to dictate and, and and win the point essentially so kpis yeah huge one first serve point one rally length brackets uh are you winning the one to four battle um 
you're trying to think what else. I mean, it changes for each player as well. I mean, it's a, it's a personalized approach. It's an individual approach. If your game style is to come into the net a lot, then um, you could Taylor Townsend. She came in like 116 times against Hallett at the US Open uh, when she beat her uh, around that number. A huge one for her at KPI as well. How many times am I getting into the net? And then how many, I can imagine, how many, how many points is she winning? Um, so it's kind of different for each player based on, on their game style, but there are some, some big ones that kind of do determine uh, if, if maybe it gives you a good shot to win the match, especially in the women's game, second serve points one, can you get that by 50%? I guess is, is a good one as well. Um, with the second serve being a, a real opportunity to attack in, in the women's game on the whole, on the whole, there's some with really good second serve returns, but the stats suggest it's an area for opportunity and area for improvement as well. All right, brilliant, thanks for that. Uh, there was a second part to that as well is, do you team analyze? And if so, do you carry out inter-rating test me testing measures at regular intervals? Um, let me have a look at that question. Is it written down? Uh, no, no, it's just been kind of uh, messaged yeah. to me privately. Um, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Can you repeat the question so I can understand it? So the question was, do you team analyze? And if so, do you carry out any kind of inter-rating testing measures? Um, I'm, I'm assuming for kind of reliability um, at regular intervals. Oh. oh, great. Okay. You talk about like in, internal analysis teams and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's played a pretty huge part uh, in British tennis of kind of having our operational definitions with coach input and getting them as solid as possible. Uh, and we, we would run um, studies on ourselves uh, in terms of A, us tagging two matches and, and looking at the difference between them and then also between each other as well. And as you can imagine, you have some things which are, uh, have high um, kind of reliability and others which have slightly more uh, variability because we do do some subjective um, uh, tagging as well. There are some subjective assessments to be made. I guess like in football, say if you're saying if someone's under pressure or not, like how do you define pressure? They're very similar here in terms of is someone under pressure, the defense neutral attack and stuff like that, all the common language that you would you would kind of think about. But yeah, that's definitely a big thing, uh, especially if we're getting data from third party companies as well. I mean, hold them to high standards in terms of their quality control and their, uh, their own processes. Uh, Cause at the end of the day, we're feeding back that information. Yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely going on. Could it happen more? Yeah, sure. But it's, it's happening. Uh, just while I'm getting a few, few of the questions together, if anyone wants to kind of jump on the microphone um, and ask Adam a question then uh, feel free to do so. Yeah. So Adam, just on kind of your the role, during kind of competitions. Um, is that mainly you're kind of allocated to, to one tennis player or you go at the start of the tournament, you're kind of working with all of the USA players that are at, at tournament and therefore having to t kind of tailor that provision to multiple users really? Yeah, sure. Who, who's asking the question? Uh, John. Oh, John, right. You didn't, didn't recognize your voice there, John. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, re really good question. So, um, and this has been true kind of throughout. In, in tennis as a governing body, there's, there's players you're supporting directly, um, which means you're, you're supplementing them with a, with a coach um, in one way or another. You're, you have kind of a, they're kind of as part of the program with you. You're, you're building that model around them with people who are employed by the government, excuse me, the governing body. And maybe they receive funding from from you and um yeah so that, so there's those there's that kind of tier of players who you're working directly with who um then there's also that that second lot who maybe they have an individual coach in a private sector who you're supplementing um with with services and information and resources and um yeah so th there's that as well so it, it is a real i mean obviously resources are finite and um but yeah there is there is ones which you're building a whole thing around and there's others which you're supplementing you have a more supplemental role with 
And that's a real key one is, is having those relationships with the private sector and the individual coaches uh, as an organization uh, to help support them as, as an American or, or previously a British player. Because at the same time, you have said that you have the same goal for them, which is to, to win matches and be successful and uh, just be an all-round, um, developing them as an all-round person and as a, as a tennis player. Yeah, so that kind of links probably into Chris's question, which is kind of do, does the kind of do the do the players come directly to you, or is almost your portal of information through those coaches? Then, yeah, yeah, really good question. Um, yeah, I mean the, the the coaches. If you go back to that model earlier, the, the coach is the is the gatekeeper for us of. Of, of that information and, and what is fed back. And uh, there are some players who are more uh, autonomous and more inquisitive and more kind of uh, have the ability just because of their personality to, to handle information. Uh, it's say it's totally, totally, totally individual. On the most part, it's, it's through the coach. Uh, the coach is the gatekeeper and the job for us really, I guess, is to make the coach the most informed that they can be to make the most informed decisions. Um, so that's a huge one, but there's definitely players uh, out there who historically and, and still do will turn around and say, show me. Um, and those who have like a, a really, really high tennis IQ, who want to see it and want to see it to believe it, if they're being told something. Uh, but really it's for us, the, the coach, and I guess the skill of the coach is to take the information that they're getting from all their areas uh, and to boil that down into manageable uh, chunks for a player, but when they're going on to court, so they only have to remember two or three things. They're not thinking that this player serves 67% out wide on, on juice or something. I mean, it's, it's changing that from, from data into some information and knowledge and uh, being, then being able to apply that into a game plan. Another really good question, uh, Adam, uh, from Andrew. Um, off the top of your head, in which instance do you feel a tactical or technical analysis that you carried out had the most impact on a player's performance? Sure. Um, yeah, good question. There was a, it would be a, a tactical, tactical one pre season um, a couple of years ago now. Um, heading into then Australia, where there was a, a tactical change to a player's serve. Um, and I, personally, I think just uh, it really, really helped to, to the coaches who are working with just how kind of uh, systematic we were with, with tracking those, those technical changes uh, over time and not only at the training base, but also when they were training elsewhere as well having the same kind of, I mean, it sounds so simple, but just the same, same views and the same frame, uh, frame rate and the same two angles. Um, and then just seeing the, the their serve performance uh, going into that, uh, that, that block down under. Um, that, that was probably the, the biggest impact. I mean, I didn't make, I didn't make the tax, uh, technical changes. Sorry, I'm, I'm a facilitator in all of this. I'm not going to, tell this player what they need to do with their ball toss or their serve or their leg drive. But um, I, would, I would personally, I would, I would say that one, just because it was a, a really systematic, good job, which helped supported the technical changes and track them over time that that player wanted, uh, that that coach wanted to make for that player. So I would say that one. And then another one, um, how much self-analysis do uh, players complete or is it mainly kind of coach-driven? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, trying to get them to do, to do more and more. There's a huge emphasis uh, around the sport, around um, journaling. Um, we try and bring that in at a lower age and stage in terms of um, things around visualization on the, on the front end and then um, uh, reflecting afterwards. So their own kind of self analysis, not only of kind of what happened in the match, but their thoughts and feelings, et cetera. And I guess that kind of all plays into that. Um, but in terms of feeding back and kind of 
in terms of the ta uh, the tactical elements of it, I would say that that's mo mainly kind of self driven. But it definitely, our players out there are on there watching watching their matches and and kind of uh, maybe like a few days afterwards or a week afterwards and thinking about what they were doing in in that match and how it played, what they would have done differently on a certain point or certain situation. Um, so yeah, that definitely is going on, and we're, we're trying to encourage that that self analysis because I'm sure lots of people are in, in sport making like autonomous players and, and athletes who are, who are really in control of their performance. Yeah, definitely, definitely agree with that. And another one just to kind of bolt on to that is if you think about the feedback that you give, is this feedback kind of individualised for each player in terms of technical, tactical data, or is there an overriding philosophy that US tennis has um, for each player when you feedback? Uh, yeah, good, good question. I mean, um, I would say there's an overriding, overriding philosophy, but um, I've definitely defaulted to stick it on a tennis court, and normally the the engagement increases uh, by a certain percentage. Anyway, I'm sure lots of people have found that as soon as you add some familiarity to the data and what they're seeing, that that kind of helps straight away. And just I guess being uh, innovative, I've had a uh, really good fortune and the opportunity and time to develop my skills uh, in different different softwares like uh, Microsoft Power BI and stuff like that, which really opens up a new a new area for, for coaches to engage with the data through filters and just clicking with it and playing with it. Um, so I think that's, that's a big one. Familiarity with what they're seeing, uh, how it's presented. That's why Hawkeye is, is a fantastic one because You've got the balls. They're they're used to seeing it on a court. They're used to seeing it on TV. They've, they've kind of been aware of it for a number of years now, so they, they kind of know what a lot of it means. And even coming to us of saying, oh, "Okay, well, I want this visual because I saw it on TV and I know it is helpful." Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's kind of what I was saying. I don't think there's any overarching um, philosophy. I guess I try and use the colours of the organisation. I'm sure lots of people do that. The, the palettes and I think that kind of helps. Um, people are used to seeing that stuff and they immediately know like, oh, it's, it's from this organization and uh, the logo and stuff like that. But no real kind of uh, philosophy yet on how we deliver data, more of a kind of a personal personal style and kind of thinking what, what's going what's gonna to grab that coach uh, and what's the best way to, to feed back to them. Brilliant. Um, and then we've got another one from Nimai from Middlesex. Um, so thanks for an interesting talk. How much do you think computer vision will play in performance analysis in tennis and PA in general moving forward? Yeah, great question, Nimai. Uh, great to hear from you. I, I think it's only going to, I mean, when I was, at MI, I was at MIT Sloan about over a month ago now, um, a lot of the EIS people were there as well. It's great to see Sarah and Julia and everyone and catch up and Kat. Um, Every other talk there was on uh, on computer vision. Um, I think it will play a part. I mean, we kind of knew when we were coming into this that the technology would catch up, and and especially using video to to tag matches, just plugging the video in maybe and stuff like that. Do I think it's there yet? Probably not in terms of the reliability that we would want, um, and uh, not just reliability, more more the accuracy. Um, which you, you get from a multi-camera setup. Could it help from lower? Did it, could it help lower level? Definitely. If you're able to take a match that you filmed on the fence and then plug it in and have a an element of kind of analysis on the match, uh, that would be very very helpful. I still think in the elite space um, where the technology is right now uh, and its sophistication, it's still the multi-camera setups and good old fashioned kind of tagging of matches to uh, generate our information. But I, I mean, I can only see it getting better. I mean, we, we tried by being part of a project that did it years ago uh, with the university and, and seeing where that was at and, and what it's moved to now, and that's about six years. So think about another few years, um, hopefully it does get to that point because it would mean a lot less collecting of information and we, we can all just kind of uh, uh, 
develop our skills working even more with data uh, rather than having to, uh, to spend our lives elsewhere. No, that's, that's brilliant, brilliant, uh, brilliant answers, uh, Adam. Uh, we've got another couple more questions, which are more kind of uh, on the lines of software equipment and stuff like that. Um, but if anyone else wants to shout out a question, um, just while I go through these questions, then uh, then go for it. This is your chance. Mm -hmm. Jamie's all right to do just a, a couple more. And then, yeah, um, so we'll just go through uh, maybe two more. Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Just got to. Uh... Yeah, so it's a really good question. If your sport doesn't have tracking software, uh, do you have any suggestions of software to practice your data visualization with? Oh, good question. Uh, data visualization. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so actually, I was supposed to say this in the in the talk for people who want to kind of get involved in in tennis uh, tennis abstract is a, is a huge resource for that there's other data sources you can get kind of online um, if you go through and you can download you can, you can check that out just do your normal kind of generic tennis data google searches i'm sure you'll find it uh, there's all kind of stuff like rankings which are really really uh interesting looking at player trajectories and whether people are on on the curve or not and if they're above or below and where they're projected to be that's fascinating i would say in terms of if you are interested i mean there's not the the tennis analysis landscape isn't isn't bustling with roles but it kind of is growing um you don't have your your man united or your, your, your saracens and other sports or uh all of your american football teams or your your uh like teams out here but your 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 club, so Gosling, Bashwood, all this kind of stuff. It's not necessarily the same. The the club is is more of a club rather than the the business in terms of like employing analysts. So, but if there is a an academy uh, near you, I mean, I'm sure they will be more than happy for you to come in with a with a camera and start filming some matches. If you take a a, a player, a junior, maybe the, um, someone who's looking to improve. Just start filming technique, uh, taking some simple practices from side and behind. Uh, and th this, there are some free softwares out there, especially during this time where a lot of people have, have been really, really generous and put down their paywalls so people and students can access some information, uh, sorry, access some software and just start generating your own information. Say you, say you, uh, you film a match and then you think, well, okay, well, I'm gonna tag, what am I gonna tag about the serve? What am I going to tag about the return? Is it depth or is it direction or forehand, backhand? And then maybe I'm going to look at every forehand they hit because maybe they're working on that. So I, I still think you can get out there and generate your own information. And I mean, Power BI, I, I allude to because it's a free, ver a free desktop version where you can start just using your own data and visualizing, visualizing it uh, in a way. And I think that's, that's so important. I was to Jamie yesterday and I was like, if, if someone, for me, if they're, they're coming in and I don't do a lot of hiring or recruitment, but I have a, a little bit, if, if they're able to show me what they've done, it, I, regardless of what level it is, there, there is a coach, there's a player, there's technical skills that they've had to apply, there's problem solving they've had to go through with video formats or where to publish or how to feedback. I think just, just being there and doing it at whatever level is a, a huge one for me. Uh, just being innovative as well. And then, thanks for that. Um, one last one then from, from Tom is, how do you alter feedback sessions for junior to college to elite players? Uh, do you find some groups are more data driven or um, technique driven? Yeah, good, good question. Um, thanks for that, Tom. I mean, as you'd expect, and I, I, I would think this marries up with other sports as well. I mean, this is just my experience, but uh, in the junior space of definitely more video based, video based content. Um, and then as you work through um, introducing more kind of data as you get to the right to the top of the sport and the, the margins are so, so slim in terms of, I mean, 
you could come out of a match and win 51% and still lose the match or 52% of the points and still lose the match. I mean, these, these things are decided, as you know, by like a point here and there. If you watched, if you watched Roger and Novak last year, the Wimbledon final and how heartbreaking that was for Roger, there was a couple of points. Um, uh, and he had match points. And so, so many of these things. So at that elite level, especially as these people are playing each other on the tour, increase that more and more. Uh, you start playing someone, you grow up with someone, you start playing them on a tour a few times. Um, and uh, they become kind of a, a rival that you want to beat because they're in your way in terms of winning tournaments and earning money and moving through the rankings. So definitely when you get to that more elite space, it's, it's looking for diving down and looking for those nuggets of, of data which, which could help that player player win but in the junior space yeah very kind of um very video driven with simple tagging of um positive and lots and lots of positives and development areas based around simple themes uh and not just technical and tactical but mental as well it's a huge one you know in the junior space i've seen is kind of mental in terms of routines and did you do your routines and were you ready to play the next point um, so yeah, as you'd expect, there's a kind of a, uh, an age and stage aspect to kind of how we would feedback. Uh, no, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, obviously I'm conscious of, uh, keeping you, uh, yeah. for, you know, yeah. any more of your day. No day but. Um, but I massively appreciate your time and obviously jumping on and answering all the questions that you have, um, yeah. any kind of questions that. I haven't managed to ask you. Um, mm. I'll maybe fire them over to you in a separate kind of email and we'll get back yeah. to whoever yeah, kind of... Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, but are you on any kind of social media or anything so people can kind of connect with you, you know, on any other level? Yeah, sure, good question. Um, yes, Twitter, uh, I think it's like at asnook08. Uh, LinkedIn, Adam Snook. Um, the, the, the two main in main places um i'm not i'm not vociferous i'm not i'm not hugely active but um it would be great to connect with everyone and kind of build up my kind of uh professional network especially during this time and just seeing getting ideas from everyone and what they're up to i mean i, I kind of screenshot different things on my phone and put them in a folder and kind of get ideas from everywhere so it would be great to connect to as as many people as possible the A sneak away and then LinkedIn Adam sneak. Um, anything from you, John? Yeah, no, Just thank to... you very much, Adam. Um, and thank you very much, Jamie, as well, for organizing this. Um, really good insights um, into a, a different sport that a lot of people um, probably weren't aware of, of how data heavy it is. Um, so, yeah, really good kind of insights and, and a couple of things I've picked up on which would be useful for us to kind of continue the conversation with. So, no, really appreciate your time. Um, and thank you very much. No worries. Uh, stay safe, everyone. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Take care.